Sean Hepburn Ferrer is my guest today, the son of two iconic figures, Audrey Hepburn and Mel Ferrer. Hello, Sean. How are you doing? I am fine. Thank you, Henrik. Thank you for joining us uh, today. Um, let's, let's get into this. Uh, this garden for Audrey, how did it come about? What is it about and why now? <laughs> Now is kind of the end of a very long process. Um, over 14 years ago, a wonderful boy, now a fully grown man in Brussels, called Rodrigue Laurent, whom you know. Mm -hmm. um, he's sort of the, the, uh, the, 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 the best person in the PR world in the entertainment industry for film and cinema and so forth in Brussels. Uh, and Paris, and um, he wanted, he's been a big fan of my mother for many years and wanted to do something to celebrate her 80th birthday. So we're talking, you know, uh, uh, not 19, but 09. So he called me in 08. And of course, uh, everything takes long. And um, especially since to make these types of exhibitions, which is why we started talking soon thereafter, work, you need sponsors, you also need the help of the city. We, we've gone through three administrations. In any event, come May of 2019, um, we were happy to present in a beautiful space in the heart of uh, Brussels, her birth town, uh, Intimate Audrey, which is, I've done many exhibitions throughout the years on her life. This one is sort of devoid of the Hollywood accoutrements uh -huh. and is dedicated to the woman, her philosophy, a little bit in line with the same way I approached uh, the Netflix uh, more than an icon that we did with Salon in London. Um, when we started talking with Nick early in the game, I said, you know, we really need to get beyond things, beyond memorabilia, you know, co-stars, directors, film, all of that people know. Mm -hmm. So I think at this point, what they're interested in is, is, was she really, you know, I get a lot of, I, I, get, I, I get this question quite a bit. Was she really like that at home? I mean, was she, because I think people get a sense that, that is who she really was, you know, but they just want that little confirmation. Uh, so the exhibition opened in May of 19. Then we went on to Amsterdam where she spent the rest of her youth during the war. And hopefully um, by no later the next spring with an interruption of two years because of the pandemic, we'll be in London, which is where she went after the war to study ballet and then the rest is history. So, um, and a little book, which we, I know we also, you want to talk about called Little Audrey's Daydream was born at the same time. And instead of doing a catalog for the exhibition, which unless you're talking about some great master, um, these catalogs, you buy them because you feel guilty that you should. And then you put it on a coffee table and move it around and it's, edges start to curl up, then you stick it in the library, never look at it again. So I wanted to do something that was much more live, sort of a biography. And since there's been dozens of bi biography on the woman, I wanted to tell a story for children whom she was such a wonderful ambassador for. She really was, even till this day. Her name comes up so many times when it comes to the rights of children, defending children. You know, we look at her as, you know, a role model. Um, Sean, uh, uh, the one thing that interests me uh, besides the, the uh, garden, it's the bust by the Dutch artist that is placed there uh -huh. and so, the challenge that you brought to him. So, so uh, at the same time as uh, we started to talk about this exhibition, to, to further answer your question, mm -hmm. um, the city of Brussels was also expressing a desire to do something. Mm -hmm. Uh, parallel to that, the wonderful artist uh, who lived in Monaco, in Monte Carlo, called Case Vercad, and who has sculpted and has beautiful exhibitions and installations all over the world, came to me and said, you know, I'm of Dutch, you know, uh, nationality. Your mother was of Dutch descent. She sp spoke beautiful Dutch. And I have had this wonderful career, been very fortunate. I'd like to do something, you know, I'd like to do it. I'd like to sculpt her to remember her. I said, oh, lovely. And so we started to talk. And then as the conversation went on, he sort of said to me, well, how do you see this? And I said, well, since you're giving me sort of a you know, blank slate, let me ask for the impossible. I'd like someone to be able to look at this statue 
and see the young woman who became an actress and a star, to see the more mature woman who became a wife and a mother, and ultimately see the wiser woman, you know, and their in the elder years, uh, who chose to give back and become an ambassador for UNICEF. And I have to tell you that by that point, she was kind of disappointed in us as a society and, and as how we treat our future generations. And so he said, well, let me try. And, and magically, um, it's not an easy piece, okay? It's not kind of bubblegum art like today, you can look at something and just, you got it right away. Like most serious things, it requires a moment. It requires a moment to sort of not only let your eye do the work, but let the artist speak to you and then to, to allow the opportunity for those three layers to come through. And as you look at the sculpture and you take a moment, you start to get it. But again, very often people look at it, you certainly, it doesn't work in a photograph, for sure. Because it's a 3D thing. It's like a photograph of a person or in real life is a very different thing, which is why some people look phenomenal on screen and they look like not much in real life and the other way around. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a good piece and it's overlooking this wonderful children's playground, really which has been installed at the bottom of her birth street. And, um, and then the southern tip, which ends on the street that she was born, is now this playground, and it's delightful. And there's even a little cinema in the corner, which is a old cinema called Styx, um, like the river of death, the one you must cross to get to the other side. Uh, and um, it's been a repertoire for many years of film noir and all kinds of wonderful things, a little cafe there. And so it's, I, I'm, I'm very, very pleased, I must say. And uh, so when Case passed away, he left me the statue in his will. How appropriate the location, uh, you know, the way you unveiled it and decided where to place it. And, you know, the cinema, of course, <laughs> that, that just... That was just a lucky, that was a lucky, that was a lucky bit. Amazing. Amazing. And one thing uh, I don't want to forget about that I uh, read about her and found out about her was that during the whole resistance, uh, her uh, passing secret notes to the resistance army. What was that about? That's, the that's whole family was in the resistance. Strange enough, both my grandparents were heavy on ideology. Uh, they were thinking that they were going to be modern and forward thinking. They were members of the fascist movements before the war. Mm -hmm. Of course, the minute that they realized where this was all leading, they said, like many people, you know, I mean, I'm sure that there's still people who have uh, extreme left leanings. If they took one look at the Mr. Putin today and, and Russia, I don't think that they would feel so good. Or, or Xi Jinping's China, I don't think that they would think that that's what... Any, you know, even at the time of Stalin, I don't think that that's what the, you know, Mr. Marx or Lenin had in mind. Uh, so, of course, when the war started, they were um, uh, mostly my grandmother backed off and the whole family was against the occupation, which was the longest occupation of any European country yeah. uh, during the Second World War. And of course, part of that was not just, I mean, they would use children because the, uh, the Gestapo or the SS would not typically stop children. So they'd get them on the bicycle riding around and put notes. She didn't know. She thought that they were love notes that they were taking, you know, from or sending to someone across town. And they had performances at night, these wonderful, like in the little, in the little Audrey book where, you know, everybody was smiling in the dark, but they couldn't clap because they didn't want to bring the attention of the invading troops. In being a good in being a good role model, your mother is timeless. Why do you think that is? You know, I've been asked this question so many times that I've, by forces, uh, you know, of gravity, I've had to think about it, and I, I came up with 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 sort of a, a way to sort of encapsulate it, mostly because of the reactions that I got to the intimate Audrey exhibition and the 
the, 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 the way people reacted to Salon's uh, uh, more than an icon film for Netflix. Um, th- let me give an example of someone like Elizabeth Taylor, who was a lovely friend of hers and whom I knew as well a little bit. She's without a doubt uh, the superstar, firmly ensconced in the firmament of Hollywood untouchables. Mm-hmm. My mother's at the other end of the spectrum. She's the girl from across the landing who goes out into the world with nothing more than a little black dress. She's not particularly buxom or sexy or, you know, she doesn't really have, and and she puts it all together sort of nicely like most European girls do. But I think we perceive her as one of us. And I think in the end, that's what's making her transgenerational, transcultural, you know, um, uh, I don't know much, I don't know how else to put it, but that's my sensation and it's sort of an instinct because you don't get to be that timeless, like you said, and that's the name of the previous exhibition, Timeless Audrey, but you don't get to do that unless people really feel you're part of the culture. Your mother managed to be bold and uh, very public about the things uh, she cared about, but she also could manage to be private when she wanted to. And she sort of navigated and managed to do that. Do you think in today's world, she would have been able to do that? Um, It's true that she was very serious and very professional, mostly because she didn't think she was anything special. So she was terrified that people would find out that she was not that unique. And so she was always on time and very nice to the crew. And she did everything that the stars typically don't do. Okay, right. she, was, she was soft and strong at the same time. And many people have this, this described her as being sort of a steel fist in a velvet glove. And it's true, I did not grow up in Hollywood, not the place, not the state of mind, because we were not a Hollywood type family. So once the film was done and she went on, she didn't like to do the promotional part. Um, it, she set it aside and it was done. We didn't have a projection room at home. I discovered her film because in those days, actors got a 16 millimeter copy of, you know, there was no VHS or DVD or Blu-ray or streaming or anything. So I, you know, put up a sheet in the attic and watch the films in the summer with the windows wide open. Wonderful flickering sound of a projector. But no, she she was not. Um, and so, yes, she was very private and she never really lived in Hollywood. She lived, we lived, I grew up in a farmhouse in Switzerland. At the same time, here is one of the people that was most photographed of the 20th century. In a time where there was no iPhone, taking a photograph and I've sort of done a pencil budget between the lighting, the photographer, the film, the development, the makeup, the hair, the contact sheets once that was all done, the time to the the back and forth, you know, whether it was mail or whatever. Then finally the approval process, which required another sort of round of air mail or whatever. And finally the printing and the printing of the press kits and it being sent all over the world. Roughly, I estimated the cost and present value of one photograph in those days to about $150 today, which you could buy a reasonably good, you know, little phone for that, you know, like a little smartphone. So, if, and, and to this day, she's been gone 30 years in next January. I still find not one photograph, an entire photo shoot that I've never seen before. Wow. So it's extraordinary. I mean, the amount, you know, so could she have dealt with it today? I think she, for her time, she was kind of the queen of Instagram, but it was all planned, you know, and she did it and got it done. And she understood, and my father did too, being a producer, understood the value of that. Mm -hmm. Mostly also because she wasn't just an actress. She was also had one foot in the fashion being sort of an, you know, an elegant person, not particularly beautiful, but certainly could fit in the model's clothes, it's the right size, um, and had this natural knack for it. So it's kind of a mixed answer because 
yes, she was very private at the same time. I think she would, obviously she'd be in her well into mid nineties now. So she probably wouldn't, she'd let go. She probably would have let go go by by now anyway. anyway. Both your parents, I mean, uh, since we're talking about your mother, uh, what has she passed on to you from her qualities, her beliefs, uh, the way she did things? What do you think she passed on to you that you do? I, I don't think I don't think I can put that into one answer, but um, certainly some of the more precious time that we spent together were the last few weeks of her life. Sometimes, you know, science and medicine can't cure you, but it, it can at least give you that notice of that time you have x amount of time you know in the famous chinese saying that says live every day as if it were your last well if he actually knew for sure that tomorrow you you know you'd be gone you'd certainly use that time to in 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 a a sort of you know very measured way and um and so we would have these wonderful conversations and uh um, about meaningful things and I'd sit you know with the lights off and as I did as a little boy when she'd invite me for a sleepover on Saturday night and we had dinner and ice cream or watch an old movie and then turn the lights off and speak in the dark now this time I was sitting in an armchair a wicker armchair next to her bed and you know with my feet up in a blanket and sort of watching her as she sort of slept in in in, in chapters you know through the night and uh, and then she'd wake up and we'd talk about something or else. And m- most of that sort of wonderful subtext g- it made it into my first book called An Elegant Spirit, uh, which has gone on to sell over a million and a half copies, which I'm told is a lot of books in 12 different languages. So, um, and it's, again, uh, I think it's because people love her. I mean, I use a very delicate whisper tone to, to write it. It took me a long time because I'm not a professional book writer. But but you asked me about her and what did she yeah. pass on to me? And, and the only way I sort of knew how to respond to that is to give you sort of a, you know, a little view into who I am and what, you know, I, I become at 62. And if I am who I am today, of course, it's in great part to her and my environment and all of that, so... Before we leave, I wanted to let our viewers know that Little Audrey's Dream is available on Amazon and other sites to purchase. I'm fascinated by it myself. It's um, really a book for all ages. It's for the child in us, you know, and in, in all of us. Uh, Sean, thank you so much for joining me for this chat. And we'll have another chat hopefully very soon. Thank you so much. Thank you.